in our cultures, Asian women want to get old because most of them suffer horribly through their teen years, often with through marriages, you know, the mothers-in-law are awful to them often. They are powerless. But once they hit that age of 40, they become matriarchs and they become powerful. So they all want to get old oh. before their time. Is that remarkable? That's <laughs> so interesting. Welcome to the Humorology Podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the worlds of business, sport, and entertainment, who are here to share their wisdom and their use of humour with you. Humorology is the study of how humour can dramatically improve your business success and your life. Humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock, and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. My guest on this edition of the Humorology podcast is a multi-award winning journalist and author. She was the first regular columnist of colour on a national newspaper in the UK. The first female Muslim too. She has written for The Guardian, The Observer, The New York Times, Time magazine, Newsweek, The Evening Standard, The Mail, and was a weekly columnist on The Independent for 18 years. She now writes a weekly column for The Eye newspaper. Self-described as a lefty, liberal, anti-racist, feminist, Muslim person, her work is highly regarded for its stance on immigration, race, diversity and multiculturalism. Her political pieces are pointed and punchy and her books bring a new light to the British Empire in a world where multiculturalism is here to stay. When she's not writing captivating coverage of the country filled with inspiring and amusing insights, you can catch her as a regular on BBC's Any Questions and The Jeremy Vine Show, plus Channel 4 News. Yasmin Alibaya brown welcome to the Humorology Podcast. Good to be here, Paul. Well, it's lovely to have you. Now, you grew up in Kampala in Uganda under the rule of Idi Amin in what was a very divided society. Was there much humour around it? If so, how did it manifest itself? Humour is what got, got the people of that country through some of the most, well, a, a really tragic history, really. Um, you know, they're incredibly benign, gentle folk, um, uh, Ugandans, uh, the indigenous Ugandans, um, and uh, happy and merry and and always laughing um and i think and, and when we were divided off from each other because the empire had these racial divisions and class divisions but laughter brought us together and i had a very dear friend called sophie who was the funniest woman i ever knew she was black she lost her husband her father to the violence in the country to the political violence three siblings to AIDS, a daughter to AIDS, and a son was stabbed to death here, yeah, oh uh, by his girlfriend. And she laughed, and last year I lost her. Mm. Um, and I just used to say to her, how are you like this? She said, what else is there? If we don't laugh, we die. It's it's so true, and 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 it's it's I suppose the one thing that everybody's got left is the, the the and under their control is the ability to laugh because tragedy is going to happen to everyone, and it sounds like uh, your friend had more tragedy than was fair, but um, yes. it, uh, but wonderful was humor valued in your family. No, <laughs> I came from a really ugly, uh, my mother was very funny. My mother had a very hard life, incredibly hard life. Um, uh, you know, bad marriage from day one. My father was 16 years older. Uh, he should never have married anyone. 
um, very smart, not, not a malevolent man, just quite useless. And it was my mother who raised the two, three children and she would talk about her life and she would kind of giggle and roll with laughter, telling you about how, you know, the first week of marriage, he took her to the cinema, forgot he was married, forgot she was there, went home to bed, left this girl in a cinema and she would laugh about it. <laughs> so she was the one who would laugh at the rest were pretty, um, you know, my father hardly ever laughed. Um, my brother was very damaged. Um, my sister had her own problem. So it wasn't a fun family, but my mother was fun. And people so, in the mosque still remember her laughing. Well, that's um, so you've taken that from her, have you? I mean, that was what yeah. I mean, she sounds like an incredibly strong woman to have brought up three children. And uh, one of the things about, I think about strength and the whole humorology project is built around this, is that strength does come from seeing the funny side. Yes, and it made her, you know, it kind of made people realize that not only was she strong, but that, you know, she was not going to burden them with with make make them cry, and in funny way, she evoked more empathy when she told her stories in the way she told them, rather than weep. Um, but she was emotionally so awake. I look, you know, I miss her to this day. Um, we were very close, and you know, my siblings didn't survive this family. My brother died an alcoholic. My sister died last year of COVID, but she was severely mentally ill. I'm the only survivor. And I'm like my mother. And do you think that that strain of having humour is the thing that actually made you survive? I mean, I don't think, you know, I don't think everything should be funny. Let me tell you this story very quickly. So when I became a journalist, which was very late in life, I was 37, and I woke up one morning and became a journalist, literally. I wrote an article I couldn't type. A week later, it was published in The Guardian. I was just ridiculous. And very soon after that, you know, I had a very rapid, I was very lucky, had a rapid um, ladder that I went up. And at one point, a, 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 an editor from a, of liberal, shall we say, left persuasion, got a bit um, drunk at her media party and he kind of lurched over to me and he said oh you've really done well um of course it was the brown that made the difference you wouldn't have got this far with that foreign name would you so I looked at him with my glass in my hand and smiled and said yeah I know I know I was so lucky to find him but imagine where I'd be if I'd married a Mr White <laughs> and, and there was a group of people all around us and they just fell about and he that was a lesson in racism he will never forget <laughs> well, that's, a, that's a beautiful and the, uh, the perfect put down we had yes. we, we had um uh the lovely joe brand on on the show and uh she said that uh, her, one of her pieces of advice, which I thought was very good, is that um, women who do get um, bullied in the workplace or, you know, wolf whistled or anything, should have a few put downs, a few heckle put downs in their back pocket because they're very useful. And usually those people who are so-called brave back off when actually somebody comes back with something quickly. Do you, do you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And but I think either you can do and I have been angry, too. I'm often, you know, when people say appalling stuff to me, I mean, apparently I'm amongst the most abused people on social media. Yeah. Um, and it's always about you're an immigrant, you're a Muslim, you're a Remainer, go back where you came from, just go back where you came from. That's the thing. And so I do kind of come back at them quite hard. But sometimes, you know, you can have fun with that. So they'll say, where do you come from? I'd say, you know, West London. No, where do you really come from? I said, yeah, West London, where do you come from? Oh, 
Yorkshire. No, but where do you really come from? <laughs> and the echo, suddenly the penny drops, you know. Um, yeah. But it's, it, it, and often it's really interesting. People say to me, we didn't know you were funny. And, and that's interesting because I think maybe I do come across as too serious too much of the time. So I need to change that. Well, I, I think that because I really wanted you on the show because I'd, I'd met you before and I, I always found that you were wonderfully funny and light and, and had a, a wonderful joie de vivre uh, yes. ab about you, which I don't think that the, the, the public perceived, did it? because no. I think they put everybody in little silos, don't they? That if you are serious about anti-racism, anti-sexism, whatever, you have to be a serious person. But do you think actually having a sense of humour about these things actually is a great tool to actually move the conversation forward? Yes, and it also makes people feel at ease. So you can sometimes say quite tough things to them if you are not saying them in a desperately serious way. Do you know what I mean? That they might listen a bit more if you kind of say it lightly. You so know, it's easier um, to say and, the and truth, it's isn't it? With... Great skill. I mean, I'm Joe Brand is amazing at it. Um, you know, some of these comedians who, who and not just comedians, some I wish more politicians, this is what you should do. Teach politicians how to use humor. They're always so dour. I mean, Keir Starmer. Oh, lighten up, man. I hear that in person, he can yes. be light and uh, thing, but he, I, it's some people when they, like when you and I do a lot of conferences, when people at conferences, they go, I must be the boss. I must be clear and I must have this serious demeanor. And I don't think that people realize that a lightness of touch and a humor actually is a, a power position as well. well. This is how I think Jess Phillips really uses that. I agree. She's really witty, she's funny, and she's very powerful for that reason. But yes, I think, um, um, you know, I think humor, as long as I, I do, I'm not one of those who would ever say we can la laugh at everything. We can't, because when there's so much pain involved, um, you know, I, I wouldn't find COVID jokes aimed at people who've lost family members funny. But it is important to remember that humor is, humor is one of the tools you have as a human being. There isn't a group in the world, past or present, where laughter hasn't been the bond, the release the 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 um the link between people i i couldn't agree more uh, but sometimes uh humor when you you grew up under the rule of idi amin and he thought he was funny didn't he i remember a quote from idi amin where he said there is freedom of speech but i cannot guarantee freedom after speech and and i'm going <laughs> that's really quite uncompromising and horrible really he was very funny and in a way we can see the danger of funny politicians charming people I'm not suggesting our present prime minister is Idi Amin but people see him as funny yes. and he's used that very effectively and Idi Amin did, I remember once I met Idi Amin did you when oh, I was 16 gosh. years old, and he was again, he thought he was, so there was this very peculiar thing that happened, but he was the general then, and a group of our student leaders ended up live, staying with the president um, for our summer holidays. And we were ordered to do this, and we were to meet all the ministers and find out how politics worked, to, this was during 68 when they were getting worried about student revolts okay. in Europe. And I met Idi Amin and I, ever, ever kind of 
careless. I said, and, you know, he was kind of up there and I was down here. And he said, I said, why are there no Asians in the Ugandan army? And he kind of looked down at me and he said, hey, 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 at that laugh from his belly. And he said, because we do not eat choroko. Choroko means lentils. And he said, we Africans eat red blood meat. You are not Africans. That was his reply. I'm interested to the, this thing that you say you'd like Keir Starmer to have more humour, but humour can also be um, misdirecting, can't it? So people don't see the, well, uh, you know, the bad things that lurk underneath. No, I think what would be nice if Keir Starmer wasn't so buttoned up, allowed himself you know, to smile, to have some wit, to laugh, to laugh out loud sometimes. We need to see that side of him. Um, you, you know, and I, I think that it will, you know, I, I've met him. In some ways I respect him, not all, but I just wish he'd let go a little bit because people relate to that. Otherwise politics becomes too distant, I think. I, I mean, I absolutely agree. And I just wonder if if that uh, it is seen now as a, a weakness that is going to be, you know, that, that if you do that, you are going to possibly make a faux pas that you can't come back from. And in such a, a hostile environment where the press and, and the media will jump on anything, the, the desperation not to show any weakness just supersedes the real person and the connection. But, but I, I completely agree. It's very, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, I was interested because you are such an advocate for feminism. And uh, I, I, I heard you in an interview say uh, that women uh, were raised to be liked and uh, and I wondered, do you think that sometimes women perceive that in order to be liked, they need to suppress their own sense of humour? Yes, there are all these unwritten rules out there um, and categories. Uh, I remember how, what a hard time they gave Jo Brand when she first started. I you worked know, with Jo in those days. Awful. And, and <laughs> I love Jo to bits, but I mean, the abuse... She was given yeah, not yeah. only at the comedy store where we worked together, but in the press. And it was, I mean, it was vitriolic and horrible. Yes. And, and um, over and over again, you find uh, women comedians or um, uh, even, you know, writing for various publications. Um, I mean, I've, I've seen how the posse has been attacking Laura Kunzberg. I mean, it's a whole posse. And that's not because, you know, she's done anything wrong, but they just want to get her for a fallen word, a slight pause. And so she's become totally humorless. Before she got this job, I, I, she used to do reports. And I remember walking up to her once at a Tory party conference saying, you know, Laura, you're so good at what you do because you're so sparkling and you smile and all this, all that stopped because mm -hmm. the posse went after her. So I think, um, and you see it with Emily Maitlis, you see it with, um, um, uh, you know, all these women, they have to be absolutely careful. And laughter, you know, one of the interesting things is the one thing Taliban and ISIS and some of the horrible Saudi-influenced imams in this country say, a woman must not be allowed to laugh too loudly in public. And if she does, she must be stopped. They tell the husbands that. The women should not be laughing too loudly. They see the threat of it. Isn't that awful? It, it is awful, but it's, I, it would seem to me that all totalitarian regimes are scared of humour because it can prick the bubble of pomposity. 
And so they they close it down early uh, because they they worry that they're, they're going to be humiliated or something. But this is very specifically targeting the women, yeah. saying a woman has to be invisible, has to be silent, has to be obedient, has to be obliging. And laughter is a kind of declaration of freedom, and they don't like it. But I, I love Among laughter. Among my many being a... rainbow of enemies, there are these Islamicists too, because they say, I'm just not the right kind of woman to be out here. I think I love the fact that uh, that you've expressed it so beautifully and it'll probably end up in the book. I'll give you a, a credit, obviously, but that laughter is an expression of freedom. Yes. And I, and I, I really think that uh, that is. And I, I also think on a personal level that, that men's egos get very damaged by funnier women. And, you know, uh, and I. I, that's why I wondered when you, you said, you know, raised to be liked. And sometimes men want to be the funny one. Yes. And, yes. and the women and, cocks their head to the side and laughs at the yes. man. And jokes. we must always laugh at their bad jokes and <laughs> <laughs> cheer them on, little things. Look, I love men. Um, you know, I've, I've loved men all my life, and men have loved me. Um, uh, which some of my detractors find quite hard to understand. But at the, you know, and one of the things is that there are too many fragile ego, male egos, <clears throat> who only see the world in terms of who's up and who's down. The best thing about living in our times is that it's finally, in some parts of the world, possible for us men and women to be equals. There's never been a historical period like this. So the burden, for example, of a man having to um, be the breadwinner and, you know, raise the, you know, the money to bring up, that can be shared. And, you know, in my book, um, Ladies Who Punch, I've quoted my absolute heroine, who's um, Mary Wollstonecraft, who said, you know, don't, to women, don't kind of, perform and be coy and play up to what men want you to be and earn your own living because if you don't both men and women lose their dignity so i think you know it's such a wonderful period we're living through and yet you look on social media and the way they treat women and the way they describe perfectly harmless women um you know, I just, you know, well, it's, feel it's quite classic. sad for them, really. Well, it's a, it's a bizarre thing when when having a sense of humour and, and making jokes could be deemed getting above your station. Isn't yes, it? yes, it's, yes. It's right. Because they, I, they, I, they love the trope. They love the trope of the angry woman, which is how yeah. they describe me. And they love the trope of the angry black woman. And anything that makes them question that, and laughter is one way, makes them even more angry. It's quite, it's really interesting to me. Uh, it is interesting, the psyche that, that, that go, goes, hold on, you're not allowed to be uh, fun or funny. We need to put you in this box, which is the angry woman with the rolling pin. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. I remember when I was young, do you remember Andy Cap? I do, yes. The do cartoon. you remember that was the trope? Yeah. A Flo, I think her name was or something, you know, curlers in her hair, rolling pin in her hand, poor little Andy, put upon. That still persists. So, it, 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 it is strange. You, meant, you mentioned Ladies Who Punch, which is one of my particular favourites of your books, and I advise everybody to read it. And, and you highlight 50 courageous women who have changed history and remoulded our culture. Um, I was also intrigued that you chose um, the women that you didn't particularly like, for instance, Margaret Thatcher, um, because you felt it was important to be impartial. Uh, one of the things that we do with the Humorology Project is uh, that we 
we ignore people's politics. We're impartial to that and just see what we can learn from their humor. Uh, do you think that humor can be a useful bonding tool across the political divide? Yes, one of my closest friends is Ian Dale. And we couldn't dis agree, disagree more. He's a Tory, I loathe Tories. He's, uh, you know, a, a Brexiter, I'm a Remainer, blah, 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 blah. But we make each other laugh. We've been friends for the longest time and actually he has done more for me than most other people in my career. And we laugh a lot together. And when I'm on the, and they ask, they, they do get in touch with it. How can you stand that woman? But you know, it's, it's, it's really good. We, we really love, um, and the reason for having Margaret Thatcher or Perry, Penny Mordaunt or, um, and Joan Collins in the book is because my criteria was women who never knew their place. That was my criteria. And these women do not or did not know their place. It wasn't about politics or feminism in the political sense. It was just any woman who said, no, thank you. I'm not going to be what you, exactly what you said. I'm not going to go into that box. I don't want that label. I'm not going to be in my place. And anybody who, and I, you know, I could have done 10 volumes. There are so many women who say no, and some yeah. in the nicest and funniest sort of Shazia Mirza is in the book, uh, the comedian. And she is utterly brilliant, utterly brilliant. Um, not only because she was, I think, the first stand up Muslim comic uh, comedian in this country, but the yeah. subjects she takes, she did a whole show on the um, ISIS brides, for example, who went off the schoolgirls. Mm -hmm. And I remember going to the show and it was full of Muslim, quite traditional looking Muslims. And she said, well, of course, they went for sex. They went looking for to their Tom Cruise. And there was this, oh, my God, what has she just said? And then everybody started laughing, saying, yeah, probably. Because they're very restricted girl. lives. Yeah. Well, and actually, but that's the... Uh, is the, is the best humor tapping into truth because yeah. that's a that's a truth that nobody wants to actually think about it's uh, this is still a teenage girl with the, the hormones going crazy yeah it tapped into a truth nobody was even thinking let alone saying um yeah. and certain i've just done a, a, a whole huge research project where I raised the money myself, um, uh, and it's called the inner lives of troubled young Muslims. And they weren't all terrorists. And some, you know, we did look in the, into the mindset of uh, wannabe terrorists. But what is so clear is sexuality is a deep issue that the families and communities just don't want to address. Mm. Um, that we want to pretend that we don't think about sex when our hormones are raving. And or that we have no gay people. Gayness is a Western thing, you know, and it's just crazy because there was a time. It's the British who outlawed homosexuality in the Arab lands and India. Is it? I Did know. you know that? Until no. then, homosexuality was free and open. And writers like E.M. Forster went to the Arab countries because there they could live openly and freely as gay men, oh, wow. which they couldn't do in Victorian England. And look where we are now. You know, so you have to kind of think about these things. Yeah, oh, God, that's extraordinary. Oh, that, that's blown my mind. Um, what makes you laugh, Yasmin? What makes me laugh? My husband's the funniest man I've ever known. He does make me laugh a lot. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'm always telling him, you know, he laughs at people falling down and things like that. He's always on his uh, looking. I, I don't find all of that funny. I find um, real wit funny. I mean, people like Ned Sherin, um, um, 
oh God, Corrin, what was his name first? Alan name? Corrin. Alan, Alan. Corrin. Um, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I haven't a clue. I mean, that British humour, I absolutely love it. Um, have I got news for you? Will have me rolling around. Um, when I was younger, I used to love all the the uh, Carry On films. You know, Ugandans loved the Carry On films. We really? loved them, but now I don't find them so funny. Um, and uh, yeah, wit more than straight jokes. Uh, the comedians I find fun. I used to love Linda Smith and Jeremy oh. Hardy. Oh, I God rest both their so souls. Much. Yeah. No, I was lucky um, enough to work with both of them. So I. Uh, yeah, yeah. They, they, so they were, they were good. Uh, what funny programs do I watch now? Frankie yeah. and Brie, okay. which has got Jane Fonda um, and uh, what's her, um, that fantastic, um, her name escapes me. Anyway, two actresses in their later years looking and just making you laugh every minute. I'm, I'm hooked on it. So whenever I've had a hard day or I'm down, that's where I'll go. It's great. That's interesting because you go, whenever you've had a hard day, that's where you go. Where you go is to humour. You also said that, that, that your husband makes you laugh. That's kind of, isn't, the whole Humorology project is about seeing what makes us so attractive to other people, whether that's in a business sense or in a personal sense. Why do you think we are so drawn to people who amuse us? What is it about the human psyche? It must be very sort of deep in, in what it means to be human. I don't know if uh, animals laugh. I don't know that. Um, but there are some animals like, that laugh. But, 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 you know, this idea of a shared humour, certainly I think it, you know, the Indian movies, which I used to, and I mean, Shakespeare saw that. In the most tragic of plays, he'll bring in the clowns. As if to make it bearable, almost the light and shade, you have to have the clowns. Um, even in the deepest tragedy. Uh, I think in Indian movies, it was the same. You always had in the old Indian movies, whatever was going on, there were these comic characters that would be injected sometimes willy-nilly into the plot. But to lift the, the, the spirits of the audience, um, and those were quite unforgettable movies. It's like there is a need. Um, to release whatever it's almost like a valve isn't it when it's done properly it's uh, uh, laughter is registering shock really and, and and that is the release and so uh, that enormous release comes with the shock i was interested to, you uh, mentioned shakespeare because you and the great maya angelou um said your first white love was shakespeare so did you fall in love with that Shakespeare humour as well as the, the the dramatic nature. Yes, all of it, all of it. We were made in, in uh, Uganda to memorise entire plays. And I'm really grateful for that. I'm really grateful because it made me absolutely love and know Shakespeare. And actually, uh, I think about six, seven years ago, no, longer ago than that. The Royal Shakespeare Company heard how much I loved Shakespeare and uh, asked me to do a one-woman show. And they gave me a fantastic director and I did a hundred shows for them here and abroad. And a part of the show was very tragic. It's about my love of Shakespeare, my relationship with my father and some incredibly funny comic scenes. And all kinds of people came to see it. Emma Thompson, I think, Julia Stevenson, Colin Firth, they all came to see it. And they thought it was an extraordinary piece of theatre. But they all said, God, that, those funny scenes you did when I acted um, my teacher, Mr. Bhattacharya, who very disapproved of Romeo and Juliet, 
because it encouraged the young to fall in love. And so he would do these lessons saying, now, girls and boys, think about that. What happened to them, to Romeo and Juliet? Silly children. What happened? <laughs> they died. Shakespeare, very clever man, he kills them to show you. Love is not allowed. You die. <laughs> I did this on stage. I did oh, this on stage. Hilarious. Proudest thing of my life, actually, that was. Do, do you think that everyone can be funny or is it a gift given to the few? I think everyone, like I said, it is what it is to be human. But I think whatever it is, life, experiences, parenting, um, kind of beats it out of you or... Uh, get, you know, doesn't allow it to flower. And it's really interesting seeing my three grandchildren. The youngest one is going to be a stand-up comedian. <laughs> I'm sure about that. <laughs> He's just irrepressible. And the oldest boy is so serious. So serious. And just wants to win. Wants to win everything. And I often want him to lighten up. And, and kind of take life a little bit more lightly and be, find things funny. And the youngest one thinks everything's a laugh. <laughs> it's so That's, interesting. It is, it is interesting, which is why I asked the question, if, if there is, you know, a comedy gene, a humorous gene that, that flows through people and, and just comes out in certain people. Because I think everyone can learn to be funnier but I'm not sure everyone hears the rhythm of how to be funny. Yes. Well, it's an instinct, isn't it? It's an instinct. Yes. Somebody says something and you just think it comes out almost before you think about it. If you've got that facility. If, um, and if you've got that facility, I think you uh, through your life, through circumstances, you know, you, you give pleasure to people by creating it. I have to tell you this because it's a very, very funny moment. So a few years ago when um, Boris Johnson was foreign secretary, I think, and we were all going to go on to the Andrew uh, Neal show and we were in the chairs outside at the studios in Millbank and another sex scandal had just broken with the, with, him you know how many so I and there were all these people or ministers and I said to him Mr Johnson I'm really upset with you and he said well, he knows knew me because we'd been on a couple of um uh foreign trips and things he said yeah well, what what and I said I'm the only woman it seems who's not been asked by you to have an affair with you and I'm incredibly <laughs> upset <laughs> I said it the very straight thing everybody fell about and he went red with anger he was not pleased he was really? not pleased he didn't laugh along with it <laughs> well yeah, but isn't that interesting that also he didn't want a woman to be funnier than him perhaps yes, yes. you know so we yes. go back to our earlier point so uh, about that that's, you know, seen as his place yes. to be yes. the amusing one. It's one of my one. proudest moments. <laughs> oh, it's a great, great put down. I love it. I love it. So, so what would the world be like without humour? Well, there are places, aren't there? I mean, there's underground humour in a lot of... Uh, in, in countries where repression is terrible. But, you know, somebody was telling me who um, is an asylum seeker from Eritrea uh, who got in touch with me because a lot of refugees get in touch with me. And they sa he said when he was in the cells in Eritrea, Eritrea is hell on earth, like Yemen is as well. He said the one thing he noticed, nobody laughed. Wow. And I've always thought, you know, Nelson Mandela in prison for all those years, he always said they laughed. They kept their spirits up by laughing at, you know, the, 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 the system. They, and this guy from Eritrea said, nobody laughs. Isn't that tragic? That is tragic. And it's indicative, isn't it, of a, of a broken society. And you know, Donald Trump had no sense of humour. 
Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Isn't that interesting? There was nothing that came out of his mouth that was funny or witty. And and it told you something about the guy's psychology, I think. Yeah, whereas um, Barack Obama, he could have chosen to be a stand-up. You know, he yes. had all the skills to be able to do that. I was born without any fear of position, right? So I can laugh at the queen and I can laugh at anyone who's got power because to me, they're the same as anyone else. I, I don't believe in the hierarchy of human beings. I don't believe some people are born to be, you know, given such respect that we may not laugh at them. And if you are in, a believer in equality, then you absolutely should be able to bring down or laugh at everyone, including yourself. So whenever I make fun of the royal family and the people who worship the royal family, people get very angry saying they're the royal family. And I say, so what? There is human as you or me, you know, as my mother used to say, just imagine them sitting on the toilet. <laughs> and then you won't be I don't really want them. to, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> But it is very important that equality and humour are connected. So do you think there's something, because obviously your book is Ladies Who Punch, do you think there's um, something about punching up being okay, but punching down yes. not being okay, because that yeah. becomes bullying? Yes. Uh, but, you know, even so, I, I think, what well, I remember before, during the awful Brexit years, I used to go and meet with readers who all wanted to have an argument with me. And I'd go to places I don't normally go to outside London and we'd meet in a pub or a cafe and they'd have a real go. Um, uh, and, then I, and then after about an hour, we would all be laughing and talking together. And they'd inevitably say at the end of it, I didn't know you were like this. Do you think that laughter is the, actually the lifeblood of any good relationship. Yes, 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 absolutely. How do you live with somebody without laughing with them? That's true, yeah. isn't it? But that's oh. true on the on the macro and the micro, isn't it? So yeah. you were talking about Eritrea and nobody laughing or in, in a flat in, you know, um, Scunthorpe. If there's no laughter in that, microcosm of society or whole society it makes things very hard yes or impossible and when laughter dies I think the society is dying I really do uh, like I said you know in Idi Amin's time Ugandans still laughed but Eritreans are not laughing today in those cells that they're kept in which I find I, I wonder what, what Terry Waite and the others, did they laugh when they were there? I must look it up. Because it was it's an very absolute shocking period of time of incarceration. Mm. And I wonder if laughter helped them. Now, this is an interesting question for me because I ask it of quite a lot of guests and, uh, and I'm very interested to hear your answer. That Have you ever taken a joke too far or crossed the line? No, I'm very politically correct. I'm very <laughs> committed to PC. Oh. I even wrote a book in defence of political correctness because I do think it's... words matter. So, no, I don't think... I might, you know, I must have over the years hurt somebody by laughing, but I can't honestly recall. And if I did, I usually, uh, you know, I'm, I just don't think people have the right to make any old joke. Well, no, no it's... Right, it's no, it's interesting, and I and I, I actually uh, recommend everybody to read in defence of political correctness because you know now racism, sexism, homophobia, you know xenophobia seem now to be proudly expressed in the world, and there seems to be a movement. You know, probably Steve Bannon started it. Of, of like people holding it up as a, a, a badge of pride. 
yet, rather and than... yet they're the same people who are so sensitive when yes. it comes to their politics and their side of the of 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 the divide um you know they they give it but they can't take it so i feel i often feel you know the same people who say let's have freedom of speech um our country is being destroyed blah, blah, blah. they want us to repeat their platitudes <laughs> they want us not to laugh at them i mean you know i would love to sit dominic cummings down in a room and have five comedians laugh at him by making jokes about him i bet he would find that intolerable takes himself far too seriously um i think in a way jeremy corbin doesn't laugh as much as he should but we've got to the point in the show now yasmin which we like to call quick fire questions quick fire questions who's the funniest business person that you've met i had i had a very good friend who sadly died a couple of years ago a ugandan nation called moise vasanji and he was very funny he was a extraordinarily successful businessman but he had the most brilliant sense of humor um and he'd have us laughing all the time and he used to call me his little socialist and he'd invite <laughs> me to dinner with all his multimillionaire friends saying i have a little socialist for you at the table <laughs> <laughs> so he was and he was so successful he was one of the um uh, he kind of totally transformed jordans the cereal company from oh, right, sinking yeah. to becoming but he was very good oh great and his his workers loved him well that's a sign of a good leader as uh, i i i think that that leadership involves a lot of laughter to be honest with you if you want to get people on your side what book makes you laugh um how to be an alien have you ever read this I do because I'm I'm half Hungarian but well, it's George I, Mikesh. I, I love it. I still I still frequently go back to it. <laughs> it's just so funny. English don't have sex. They have a hot water bottle. <laughs> <laughs> it's so accurate. So yeah, it's one of my favorite. That is so bizarre because I was brought up with that book in the house because my father was a Hungarian refugee. I don't know if you knew that, but no. uh, and 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 everybody used to call it George Mike's, especially as in America. And it's it's Mikesh, actually George isn't it? Mikesh, yeah. And uh, my father was because my my father when he came to this country in fifty six uh, uh, after the uprising, he had to escape. My father. Uh, when he came to England, couldn't believe how people uh, behaved because he used to walk up to people and, and go, hello, uh, my name's Laszlo. How much do you earn? <laughs> <laughs> and he used to say the ashen people used to go. It's like they'd been stabbed through the heart with a bread knife. <laughs> it, it was like because nobody ever said, but um and the good thing about my uh, my father is that he knew because he was Hungarian how to tease and how to play which when he arrived in Britain that everybody you were talking about people being buttoned up was very buttoned up and so women all loved my father because he would just say nice things to them <laughs> that shirt really suits you that's a beautiful outfit and nobody ever said this stuff you know it, and so he was very popular with the ladies including my girlfriends as I was growing up um <laughs> anyway it's an aside uh, what film makes you laugh i mean i i do think um richard curtis films uh, i i adore them four um, weddings four weddings which we watch every year because our daughter's mm -hmm. crazy about them notting um, hill notting hill i love notting hill I just think it's gentle humor and I like that a lot. Um I don't find um these kind of uh, America some of these American comedies, you know, the airplane and all that they're very witty. The 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 script is fantastic. 
you know, warm, whereas the uh, uh, Richard Curtis does warm comedy, and I love that. Ah, lovely. Ah. So we've cut, touched upon it already, but what is not funny? Anything that disregards the inequalities of influence and power and money um, and picks on those who are disempowered, which is what was so wrong with the, the Jimmy Carr joke. You know, gypsies are amongst the most persecuted people in Europe. And it's not funny when you pick on them. Um, so I think it's always being aware that there are some people who are still living impossibly difficult lives and to laugh at their expense. I think it's different with their, you, they're laughing with you. But if you're laughing at them, that's not on for me. What word makes you laugh, Yasmin? <laughs> what word makes me laugh? Boris. <laughs> <laughs> Did, how did this happen? This this man with such a name. You know, I wouldn't buy a melon from him in a market. And he's here. So he, yeah, that word makes me laugh. Uh, well done. Um, I wouldn't buy a melon from him in a market. I just love that <laughs> phrase. <laughs> it's like, uh, um, what sound makes you laugh? Sounds. Oh, I, I love the sounds of little children and babies. I mean, I will always break out into a smile or a laugh. I think there's something so compelling when you see a little or hear a little child laughing in that way that they do. Um, yeah. yeah. It's wonderful. It's, it is my favorite sound as well. You went to Oxford. Would you rather be considered clever or funny? Probably clever. <laughs> yeah? Probably clever. Why? If I'm honest. Because it's very hard um, for someone like me to end up in a place like that. And you have to be smart and and I like the fact that I got there and, and got out alive. It was a horrible place. Um, so, yes, I don't want to be a fun. I am funny, but I, I am smart. I like to be to think I'm smart uh, because nothing was given to me ever in life. Nothing. Wonderful. And finally, Yasmin, desert island gags. You can only take one joke with you to a desert island. What is that joke? Uh, I love the limericks, one of the limericks that have been produced as we speak on Prince Andrew. I think they would have me, oh, you know, the grand old Duke of York, all these new very witty things I, would make me laugh. Um, I think that would be it at the moment. Currently, I'm laughing at Prince Andrew. <laughs> and he really does make me laugh. Is the, there's no actual joke that you'd like to Actual end jokes? With? I'm not into actual jokes. I would only know one and it's not very good. Oh, well, tell um, us it anyway. Okay, hang on, let me think. Uh, what, what? Okay, how did Batman, Batman call Robin for, for, uh, to come in and eat? Dinner, 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 Batman! <laughs> Not good. <laughs> no, but it did make me laugh, and you, I can imagine your grandchildren loving yes. that. I think I got it the wrong way around. Uh, so Robin calling Batman. Dinner, 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 Batman. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. 
And you've been wonderful and enlightening. Thank you so much for being a guest Thank on the you, Humorology Paul. Podcast. Thank you, Paul. It's been such fun. The Humorology Podcast was hosted by Paul Barros. Produced by David Rose. Music by Steve Hayworth. Creative direction by Les Hughes. And additional research by Helen Sykes. Please remember to subscribe, like and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production.